Okay, welcome everybody to Fitter and Faster Live TV. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. It's a very special event for me. My name is Brett Hawk. I am a director of swim camps and clinics at Fitter and Faster and very excited to present this um, special guest today. He is actually one of my former competitors and a good friend of mine and um, one of the greatest sprinters in Olympic history, somebody that I looked up to as a swimmer, somebody that I took great pleasure in competing against and took even uh, greater pleasure in getting to know as a person. And um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Gary Hall Jr. to everybody. Well, hey, Brad. Uh, hey buddy, how are you? All is well, considering. <laughs> Yeah, it is. Uh, where are you right now? Venice, California, hunkered down in a bungalow. Ah, yes, like all of us. Uh, crazy times, but um, hopefully we'll all get through this pretty soon and we can get back to regular life. But Yeah, yeah, looking forward to that and uh, getting back into the water one of these days too, uh, doing a little mm. swim. Yeah, you still, you still keep in touch with the water? I uh, I shower regularly these days. Uh, Good, thank God. <laughs> that's about it. I, I uh, just started uh, doing some lap swimming uh, probably about a year ago after a long break, and uh, always loved it. Never walked away from the sport thinking oh, I don't want to ever see a pool again the way some people do. Um, I just got busy did some other things, and uh, I feel like I'm uh, circling back to uh, more regu regular visits to the pool. Yeah. Well, listen, man, you've got an incredible story, and uh, I'm I'm thankful to be part of it in some way to to witness it, and uh, and there's a lot to go over, and I want to get into some of that stuff. Obviously, the topic today is talking about Olympic gold. I want to I want to try and understand um, how you first thought of becoming an Olympic champion, then actually going ahead and becoming one, and then and then repeating again as well. So I want to talk maybe physically about some of the things you did and then also mentally because you're obviously um, very world renowned for being a mentally tough athlete and somebody that could get in the heads of his uh, opponents. And um, you are, from my point of view, uh, I think of you as a, an introverted person with a, with an extrovert personality because I, I've seen you compete on the world stage, but um, getting to know you as a person, I know that you are, you know, a very private person as well. And, and so um, there's a lot to, there's a lot of different facets of your life that I want to get into. But I, I did want to start with one question, okay? Are you still there? I, you, I lost you for a second. I, I am here. I, we lost the video, um, okay. which is all right. <laughs> you don't have to listen. To me. Um, but yeah, I, I should uh, jump back on, I think, uh, momentarily. So uh, there's a poor, uh, low connection. Oh, okay. All right. Well, we still have the audio for now, and then hopefully we can get the video back. But um, I did want to ask you a question straight off the bat. It's a tough one, okay? And it's from a friend of mine. He's been putting out a lot of videos, swim videos, and analyzing different races. Um, and it's Coach Andrew Beggs here in uh, Columbus, Georgia. And uh, like I said, he's a good friend of mine, and he posed a question today. Who is the greatest sprint freestyle of, of all time there there you go that's nice so um i have an opinion on this who's the greatest sprint freestyler uh, of all time and i'd like to get your hello. opinion you there we got you gary Hey, you there? Okay. Can you? Uh... <laughs> Hello. All right, we're back. Yeah. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, we're good now. Okay. Okay, good. I'm gonna go straight into the lead question. Who is the greatest sprint freestyler of all time in your eyes? Uh, Duke Hanamoku. Nice. Nice. To explain, talk, talk to us about him. 
Well, he was uh, some uh, lineage of royalty, the Hawaiian Islands. He was a swimmer, swam in the ocean. That was his connection to uh, the sport. Uh, came over to the mainland in the Olympic Games and uh, was the fastest swimmer in the world in what was then the sprints. Um, and uh, he is also uh, probably more famous for uh, popularizing the sport of surfing around the world, uh, introducing that sport to Australia and California and uh, was just a great ambassador for watermen and waterwomen uh, alike. Uh, our, our love of, of, of water and the ocean and, and, and swimming and surfing, uh, he to me was uh, just a, a great ambassador, um, generally liked by all people uh, in, in the Hawaiian Islands and, and uh, yeah, really helped to uh, popularize the sport uh, early days, uh, 1920s era. And when did you first hear about his story? Um, you know, I had seen pictures of a, a guy, they've got a famous statue of him uh, in Oahu. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, early days, I was as a youngster, a family trip to Hawaii uh, kind of came across uh, this uh, a legend uh, and his story and was always intrigued by that. Um, uh, I was born into a swimming family. Uh, my father was... Uh, three-time Olympian. And um, so, uh, yeah, I, growing up, I was surrounded by swimming greats. Uh, Mark Spitz was a groomsman in my parents' wedding. And um, and uh, so, um, but Duke Kahanamoku, Johnny Weissmiller, those guys um, in, in a, a, a golden era of the sport uh, really uh, inspired my imagination and, and made the sport seem cooler than just dad was a swimmer too. Mm, yeah, makes sense. And did, did you want to be a swimmer from you know a very early age? Not exactly. I knew how to swim before I could walk. I was introduced to the sport very early, um, and uh, I uh, grew up swimming uh, in, in backyard swimming pools. Uh, you know, and if there was any racing, it was I'll race you from here to there, one side of the pool to the other. And um, usually, for, you know, the stakes were uh, a popsicle in the summertime or something like that. Um, and I was always a good swimmer um, just because the amount of time that I spent in the pool. I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona, where it's unbelievably hot. And uh, it was one of the few escapes from the heat. It can be 120 degrees in the summertime. So you were either at the bowling alley, which was air conditioned, the movie theater, which was air conditioned, or a swimming pool. And so uh, I, I knew how to swim, but I did not have that ambition to be uh, following in my father's footsteps to qualify for an Olympic Games. Um, the, we all have seen young kids that are dedicated to the sport and know that what they want. And at eight years old, and saying, I want to be an Olympic gold medalist. Um, I was never that kid. I was uh, more interested in just cannonballs and, and, and slip and slides and, and skateboarding after school with my friends. Um, so I, it was a, a very fun approach, uh, indoctrination into the sport. Signed up for a couple of summer league uh, seasons, you know, a two month, uh, rec swim type of thing at where, you know, I competed a couple times, but, um, I didn't really join a year round swimming program until uh, much later until I was 13. It was many years after that, that I was any good that I ever even thought that, uh, swimming at the Olympic games for myself was a possibility. So how old were you in 1992 when the games were going on? Yeah, so I, I remember watching the 1992 Olympics, and I was just really uh, a young swimmer, not very good. I was in high school, must have been a sophomore, junior. I, anyway, um, and, and so um, I remember watching the swimming events and thinking to myself, what do I have in common with these people? And at the time, it seemed to absolutely nothing, um, even really? though. Uh, turning up to the pool. Um, you know, it, I, I mentioned that my dad was an Olympic swimmer. I do also remember having an inspiring moment at the 1984 Olympic Games in Los Angeles. We mm. went and watched the 100 freestyle. Rowdy Gaines won. Uh, mm. Saw other unbelievably inspiring performances out of those Olympics. And even though I, I knew that my 
dad had this back history in, in, in Olympic sport and in Olympic swimming and even carried the flag for the United States of America in the Olympic Games. Um, it wasn't until I, I was able to see um, other people out there doing it and in person at that level uh, that I was really kind of grabbed by um, uh, how neat the Olympic movement really is. Um, but it wasn't until the end of high school that I, uh, the summer after my junior year in high school specifically, that I thought I would even be swimming in college. I was not fast enough to uh, really until that time. And then um, it wasn't until the summer after my freshman year in college that I thought I could, I could make the Olympics. Wow. Wow. That, that's pretty cool. Um, that, that you went from kind of there to there pretty quickly in that progression, um, not, not believing that you could be there and not even thinking that you could to thinking that you could within a couple of years. And then even a couple of years later, we're at the 1996 Olympics. It's in Atlanta, and you uh, are in a battle now with um, the previous winner from the last Olympics. His name was Alexander Popov. He won the 50 freestyle and the 100 freestyle, and um, and all of a sudden, you two are are the big guns. You know, you two are the names, and and going into that Olympics. Um, were, were you being talked about in that respect or was it not until you were at the Olympics and, and finally racing against him? Did that, did that rivalry start there or was it a little bit earlier? No, uh, the rivalry started uh, within 20 seconds of meeting Alex Popov. Um, and that was in the ready room before uh, at the 1994 World Championships in Rome. It was my oh, first okay. international swimming competition, the first time I made a national team. And I was, uh, had qualified for the finals. Uh, I walked into the ready room and, and uh, uh, Alex uh, came in after. I, uh, I, I was in there and walked straight up to me and um, uh, the rivalry began. Wow, yeah. So you just, you just kind of clash from the get-go, is that it? Yeah, 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 that was a sincere uh, rivalry. Yeah, oh yeah, it was. I mean, I... Uh, so my experience was I was I was sitting at home. I was watching the 96 Olympics from home. Um, I was a 20-year-old kid. So I think you and I are actually the same age. Um, and so I'm, I'm your age, but I'm sitting at home watching this unfold. And you, you know what it's like in Australia. Swimming is huge. And we've got great sports commentators. And so the way that they built up this rivalry between you and Popoff was uh, great television, you know. And then you have a moment, and talk me through it, you, you had a moment that goes down in history where you did a little bit of uh, shadow boxing, I believe. That, was, that the, was that the first Olympics where you broke out the shadow boxing? It is the first Olympics that I broke out the shadow boxing, but I had been uh, shadow boxing uh, and, and horsing around behind the blocks um, before a race uh, dating back uh, to high school days. Oh, um, wow. I was a very, very tall, skinny kid um, before uh, a lot of swimming added some bulk uh, through the years. But uh, it, kissing my biceps in high school was a really funny thing to do behind a, a block because I was just so toothpick thin. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it was good for some laughs. But, you know, you would incorporate uh, pre-race rituals, and I wasn't going to change that. And it also lightened the atmosphere a little bit for me. There were people that were in on the joke that were kind of having a, a laugh about it the way I was. And there were a lot of other people who saw that and were like, oh, what an arrogant jerk. Uh, I hate that guy. Yeah, yeah. Now, so was that before the 100 freestyle? Uh, I did it before all my races, uh, either some you know, chest thumping or arm wave, like, something, I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 I remember um, uh, one meet in Mission Viejo, uh, years before I competed in the Olympics, and uh, it involved uh, kung fu uh, type of ritual. Uh, like, uh, oh, really? Yeah, so I don't know. Uh, whatever struck me at the moment. Uh, so is that the way you handled nerves as well, is, is to make kind of light of the moment? Is, uh, is that, was that the best way for you to get in into the performance attitude that you needed? It helped. It helped. Um, you know, it, it, I always had 
the perspective that sport is entertainment. And that uh, even though we've dedicated our lives to this pursuit, um, at the end of the day, it really isn't that important. <laughs> Whether I go 21.3 or 21.7, um, uh, I, I'm not saving lives here. Not, you know, like I, it, it, it. And so, yeah, I think just kind of having a little bit of that um, uh, just, um, approach uh, kept, kept it in, in check that this is, uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, sport uh, and, and um, sport is entertainment and something that you should have some fun with. And um, so, yeah, I, I, I think that there was benefit to uh, that, that approach that I, that I took. And I don't think it was a strategy, but uh, I, looking back, I definitely saw that there was uh, benefit. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm hoping we can show the video of the 96 um, swim here. I know that Tyler Clary is working behind the scenes for us right now, and I know he's got the link to the uh, video, and I'm hoping that he may be able to show it for us. Um, if not, we can we can certainly keep talking. Now, at the at the '96 Olympics, you ended up finishing second in both the uh, 50 freestyle and the 100 freestyle, correct? Yeah, uh, the, just by uh, seven one hundredths of a second. Um, yeah, just uh, the narrowest of margin of, of being a three time uh, winner uh, in, in the 50 freestyle. Um, yeah. But you know. We, I've always said you learn a lot more from your losses than you do from your victories, or at least the people that uh, you know, improve and evolve uh, do. And um, yeah, this, this, you know, I think all of us have had one of those swims where we're haunted by the smallest margin of time. You know that we just mm -hmm. know that number and think over and over in our in our minds you know, how we could have made that slight difference, uh, what we could have done to. Uh, you know, affect the outcome, and um, and so uh, it, it was a it was a real driver for me, um, pushing me toward two thousand. Uh, had I won the fifty uh, or the hundred or both uh, in Atlanta, um, there's a real strong possibility that I probably would have retired from the sport. Oh. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, uh, those, those narrow losses push us further than we would have otherwise taken ourselves. Yeah, uh, it's a great lesson, uh, and I agree. I, I'm the same way. I missed the Olympic team by three one hundredths for Atlanta, and I think if I had have made that Olympic team and gone, I, I may not have ever swum beyond that either. So I, I kind of have a very similar experience to you in that. But um, uh, Tyler, hey, hey guys, uh, not too bad. So I tried playing that video, and unfortunately, the owner of it has disabled playback on other websites. So what I am going to do is I'm going to put that link in the chat for everybody to go and check that out on their own um, and Perfect. kind of we can all watch it together um, as as this conversation goes on but unfortunately we're not able to show it for you guys so apologies for that check it out hopefully in another tab while you're listening to gary and brett talk this through awesome awesome so gary looking back now um that you end up going on and winning uh you know, the 50 freestyle in Sydney and then backing it up later again, as we know, in, in winning the 50 free in, in Athens four years later. Do you think at the time in Atlanta that you were uh, ready to win or and you missed an opportunity or did you swim beyond where you probably were at that stage in getting the silver medal? Um, how do you look at that performance? Oh, I, I, I that was the best that I could have done at that time. Those, those were best times for me yeah uh, my best performance out of those games by far was the four by 100 freestyle relay i wow. dove in i dove in uh, for the first time ever the united states was behind i was a body length behind um and, and, uh, on that relay diving in after the third leg and just uh that was the fastest split uh that anyone had ever swum before uh, to bring in that home to win the gold. And so I was really proud of myself. Um, you know, I, I, I couldn't have been that disappointed. Um, obviously, you know, it, it felt like I had, uh, you know, one step left to summit Mount Everest by placing second, going around telling people I'm the second best in the world. 
I just didn't have that panache uh, that uh, that um, yeah. winning uh, does. Um, yeah. and, and so, but knowing where I was at the time, um, the the uh, the type of coaching uh, I had just recently the year before ninety five come into contact with Mike Bottom and that changed my training style drastically. I mean, it, so I, I was, I was on the kind of the, the learning curve ramping up yeah. in terms yeah. of uh, international race experience. So I, yeah, I wasn't um, disappointed, but I, I, I did feel that there was one more step to take. Definitely. Yeah. Unfulfilled. Sure. Now the relay four by one relay where you're a body length behind at the '96 Olympics and dive in and and uh, and catch up and win gold. Um, what is that experience like? What's what's going through your head during that? Are you thinking I I'm chasing these people down? I'm winning the gold medal, or are you just swimming as fast as you possibly can without any thought at all? Uh, swimming as fast as you can. You know, I go crazy out there, and uh, you know, it was neat because. Um, Atlanta was the first time that I'd walked out onto a pool deck and seen a lot of people there. You know, you go to even Olympic yeah. trials, and the majority of the people in the seats are family and friends of, of, of people competing at that meet. And yeah. all of a sudden, in, in practice, anybody who's in the sport knows that uh, with practice, you've got uh, a coach with a stopwatch um, and a cup of coffee. Uh, and for the morning practices, the coach was in the uh, uh, warm office, uh, you know, a, a third of the time. So you mm -hmm. go from an audience of one um, at, at morning practices to walking out and there being 15,000 people in the stands and something yeah. to a billion people watching on TV. And mm -hmm. the adrenaline, I mean, you just feel the electricity in the air, the, 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 the pulsating, mm -hmm. just everything's vibrating, um, the, the energy. And adrenaline, it's a rush. And so um, when that uh, relay exchange happens or the gun goes off, uh, yeah, just go. No time to think, just, uh, yeah. So that, that, that was it. I, it. It felt great. I mean, we've all had swims where everything just feels yeah. up on top of the water and, and it just feels effortless. And, and, and um, yeah, it was uh, one of those kind of neat, exhilarating experiences. Um, that, yeah. Uh, that I loved. I mean, that, and it was racing. I mean, that's what kept me in the sport, really. I, I, I loved race, and uh, you know, all the all the training, early morning practices, all the sacrifices along the way. It, it was worth it for that that rush of uh, the thrill of that the race at the end of the season. Yeah, that's interesting. Let me ask you that because a lot of people, including myself, that you know, you want you want to perform, okay, and you want to be at your best when it counts the most as well. And so those Olympic performances, you want them to be the best swims of your life, right? But um, you also want it to be one of the greatest experiences of your life. And But when you're actually in it, I can tell you this from experience myself, when you walk out onto that pool deck and then all of a sudden your whole career flashes be be before your eyes and then the thought of becoming an Olympic champion starts to – and then the thought of performing, like you said, in front of 15,000 and millions of people at home – that can really have an effect on people. But for you, it seemed like it brought out the best in you. It's almost like there was a freedom for you to really express who you were in that sense. And you and there was a relaxation that I noticed and, and then the ability to perform at a very high level. What, what do you think it is in that environment for you? Uh, somebody said, you know, a champion isn't determined by their victories. A champion is determined by how they deal with adversity and under pressure. Right, um, in a pressure situation, and so that's absolutely true for the Olympic Games. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's easy to do. Uh, when I, I spoke to a reporter not too long ago about the postponement of the 2020 Olympics to 2021, and uh, there was talk at the time about uh, there's, there's some suggestion that we do a virtual race, like everybody kind of submits their times from different pools, and that completely eliminates um, the the intensity of, of, of the competition. Um, that that determines what what a, what a champion is, and so being able to deal with that pressure situation uh, was something that I um, I wasn't more calm about it. Um, I, I really uh, anybody who uh, doesn't show signs of stress out there 
um, are just have a better poker face than the other competitors. We're all dealing with that pressure. Um, mm -hmm. The pressure is so intense. It, it just uh, feels like your head's about to uh, pop like a pimple. Um, it, it just, it, you, like your brain is just going to, you know, like, it melt. It just, and, and um, it, it's the people who are able to kind of uh, deal deal with that pressure and take that in, in as much stride as possible uh, that, that are able to excel. Um, again, it, you know, it, and, and it's part of, it's part of the package. Uh, so he, he, I knew that if I didn't feel stick to my stomach with nerves before a race, mm -hmm. that I was not going to perform well. Mm, interesting. Uh, so I, and I knew that that was going to that, 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 that sick, feeling in the pit of your stomach is going to dissolve, like disappear uh, the second you touch the wall at the end of the race, right? So um, you knew that it was temporary. Um, now, temporary is a pretty big window when you've got the lead up to the Olympic Games. Each day, you know, you see that ticker on the NBC corner of the screen, you know, uh, how many more days left, to, you know, the games and stuff like that. And, and it's like an hourglass, you know, the sand just kind of piling up upon your shoulders each day a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. So it's not like you wake up one day and I'm like, oh, my God, the pressure. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, but it's a constant, and uh, it, it culminates in, in peaks uh, in the ready room and walk out to the blocks right before the race. Wow. And, uh, yeah, you know, sports psychology is an area that um, we are still improving on. You know, even the best sports psychologists in the world don't have it figured out, right? Like what differentiates, you know, one person in one lane who does the exact same yardage, the exact same set, eating the exact same meal as their competitor. Why does one person do great at the end of the season and the other person uh, fault it? Um, so they are dedicating more and more brilliant minds uh, to understand why and, and we've got tools now with bio uh, feedback and, and brain mapping to see you know what uh, an athlete in the zone it, what their brain is doing in these pressure situations and uh, this is the area where we're really going to see uh, continued improvement in years to come uh, why we will continue to see uh, drops in times my father when he competed in the 60s and the 70s None of his teammates, uh, except for one, uh, who was an amateur bodybuilder uh, before getting into the sport of swimming, would go into the weight room and lift weights. Now, yeah. uh, what high-level swimmer isn't lifting weights, right? Strength training and conditioning have become a critical part of the formula uh, to fast swimming. And so nutrition is another area, um, you know, that, that we are seeing, you know, improvements uh, upon. Um, but sports psychology really is, is, is an area and understanding why one person does well, um, what approaches work. Um, I had a few that I employed uh, that I learned from some of the most brilliant sports psychologists in the world. Uh, when you're an Olympic swimmer, you know, you, these types of people uh, want to use you as a lab rat. And so I was very fortunate to come across some really brilliant minds that were able to give me some guidance on, on, on things that I could Eventually, do to help uh, not alleviate that stress because you can't make it go away. But but how the perspective that we have and how we manage that stress, um, you know, is, is the difference. I think. Wow. Well, yeah, that's super interesting to me. I, I studied psychology in college, and and you know, going through the Olympic experience, um, it is really fascinating to me. And then then going on to be become a coach. And seeing how the psychology can affect performance uh, big time. But um, I did want to say one thing, Gary. Um, I have a 17 year old son, and we don't sit around talking about my history and my past and that sort of thing. But I did, I walked into his room a little bit earlier and uh, I said, Do you know who Gary Hall Jr. is? And he said, No. I said, Well, he's a big part of my history and he's a good friend of mine. I'm about to interview him on. Uh, on live TV, so I want you to come out and listen. So my son's been sitting here listening, and I, I just want to introduce him. Kobe, come here, man. So this is my son, Kobe. Hi. That's Gary. Hey, Kobe. Uh, Sorry to make you sit through this. Uh... <laughs> yeah. No. Um, 
but I said, like, like Gary's one of the most fascinating people um, that I know, and and he's uh, he's got a lot of interesting things to say about performance. And my son's a musician, so he's not a he's not a an athlete in that sense. He's very athletic, but uh, he's not an athlete. But I I did want to, uh, him to hear your story. Now, we'll we'll go on to Sydney real quick, and you can you can continue to listen. I appreciate it, but um. We'll go on to Sydney because that's, this is where you and I kind of uh, meet for the first time for, for our stories. Um, you end up tying for the gold medal in the 50 freestyle. I was uh, competing against you um, in the 50 freestyle. I ended up um, making the semifinals, uh, finished 13th in the 50. Um, but from my experience, I uh, – I, I, uh, I missed the final, you know, by I think it was less than a tenth of a second. Um, and I was so devastated that I actually, and this is this is kind of embarrassing to say because I'm, I'm very much a team person, but I was so devastated about not making the final that I actually went to the track and field that night um, because the, you swam the semifinal the night before and then the finals the next night. I was so devastated. I couldn't eat the whole day. I felt sick to my stomach that I missed the final at my home Olympics. In, in the only event that I was competing in. And so I, I took myself to track and field. I, I've actually never watched the 50 freestyle from Sydney. So I have to admit that, Gary, I've never seen you win. I knew, I heard you won. Um, I heard you tied for the gold. But um, it was one of, those, one of those races that I just couldn't watch. But um, so talk us through your experience with that one. Well, Sydney was uh, – um a neat Olympics. You know, people always ask me when I do a swim clinic, you know, what was your favorite Olympics? So the ones that you competed in. And I said, well, Atlanta was the home crowd advantage. Uh, you know, having the majority of people in the seats cheering for you uh, was really neat. Sydney uh, was just the opposite, where everybody in the stands were cheering against you. Um, but what was really neat about uh, Sydney was that the appreciation level for the sport of swimming, something that I dedicated my life to, to that point, is through the roof, uh, something that we never experienced in the United States. So I could get in a cab after uh, a, a night of swimming, and the cab driver could tell you the splits from the 200 freestyle, mm -hmm. uh, about three to five finishers. I mean, it, people really love the sport, appreciate the athletes there. And that was yeah. just something that was really refreshing, um, even if they were cheering against us. Uh, you know, I, 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 it was um, it was still neat to see that uh, level of appreciation. So I don't know. I, I went into those games. I had been diagnosed with uh, type one diabetes a year and a half, and told by two doctors that it was the end of my swimming career. So it was a surprise to me and a lot of other people that I was uh, there at all, um, which helped alleviate some of the expectations, maybe. Um, you know, and and, and so. Um, I had become the first person uh, in any sport to qualify for the Olympic Games with type 1 diabetes. And in Sydney, I became the first person uh, with type 1 diabetes to medal uh, in any sport. So that was neat. Um, there was a significance in doing that that went beyond just representing the United States of America um, and, and the sport of swimming. Um, when I expanded uh, you know, this interest uh, among the diabetes community and what I was doing, um, that really kind of gave, again, um, you know, in life, if we're doing it right, we're gaining perspective, we're gaining insight. Um, and, and so uh, through that diagnosis, um, it really kind of helped create that perspective on, you know, what sport is. Um, and, 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 but also uh, there was discovered through that process um, an appreciation for what sport is, and then it, it ultimately served as this platform for something much larger than uh, a medal or, or, you know, a fast time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you went in there with a lot of adversity on that one, and, and um, it's just incredible that you're even there. I remember the build-up to that and people talking about your diabetes, and at the time, as one of your competitors, I thought to myself, oh, well, Gary's done. There's no way he can compete with diabetes. And so that's kind of check him off the list and I'll start to worry about some other people. And then, then all of a sudden, you know, you, uh, you figure it out however you did, because I'm sure there was enormous challenges with that. Um, and then qualify for the Olympics and then, and then turn up at the Olympic games. And 
the the daunting task of of competing against you. I mean, you're you're definitely a uh, uh, a personality, you know, um, and you have you have uh, you certainly carry that on the pool deck. Is that something that you notice about yourself? Like when you know, at the time as a as a competitor, did you were you conscious of the way that you carried yourself on the pool deck and the way that maybe uh, that affected your competitors? I've always been accused of being an independent. Um, I've always been accused of being different. Um, I've always uh, heard comments from teachers, parent-teacher conferences growing up about me saying, oh, he walks to the beat of a different drum, stuff like that. Um, so it wasn't uh, – and swimming, uh, to my mind, um, still to this day and, and definitely at the time, was a, um, a sport of, of conformists. Um, you know, it didn't matter if you're a 400 IM or a miler or a 50 freestyle or a 200 breaststroke or a 100 butterflyer. Everybody does the same set, uh, right? Uh, maybe at a, a college level, you start breaking down, you know, into different groups. But at the time, you know, it was every, everybody walks in a single file line or swims in a single file line. Yeah. You don't question why we're doing this set. You know, I, I'm doing 100 100s. Okay, coach, that's a 10,000 meter set. I know it's very difficult, but that pain that I'm experiencing doing that is very different than the, uh, the last 15 meters of 100 freestyle. You know, I, I, and, and so I never really, um, uh, you know, I, so I don't know. I, it, no, it wasn't something that I was doing, um, you know, like uh, playing, a, 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 you know, trying to be different or anything like that. I just, didn't um, feel, I've never been able to, I hate single file lines. I hate single file lines. I, like I can't do it. Yeah. Um, uh, if we're talking left brain, right brain, I, I, my, uh, yeah, my straight line looks a lot more like a Paisley. Yeah, 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 I certainly noticed that. Uh, and, and we'll talk about uh, one of your other famous performances in, in a minute in, in 2004. Um, but talk us through, you know, just the final. I mean, you're in the final with your teammate, Anthony Irvin. Anthony's a very young man at the time as well, kind of like what you were in, in Atlanta. Um, what was your relationship like with him before the win? And then and then obviously you end up tying for the gold medal. And, and when, you know, talk us through that a little bit. Yeah. So Anthony was young. He was 19 at the time. And uh, I knew about Anthony when he was in high school. Uh, Mike Bottom, my coach, was uh, up at Cal, and uh, he was looking to recruit Anthony uh, from Valencia, um, down in Central California, I guess. Um, and um, so, I, yeah, I met him, I think I, maybe even on his recruiting trip up to Cal. And, um, and uh, then, you know, we partnered up at, uh, and started training together. And uh, he, it was, it was clear that this guy, um, even unrefined as he, he was in those very early years, uh, he knew he was going to be as good as he became. Um, he, 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 he is that talented, um, and, and uh, people can talk uh, a lot more eloquently about uh, his uh, feel for the water and. and um, and technique-wise, uh, you know, the front-end catch, he, he changed uh, the way people were kind of uh, swimming freestyle. Yeah. Uh, trying to mimic uh, what he was doing on that front-end catch and hand entry on the front side. So it was great to be training with him. Um, I was 25 in those Olympics, so about six years older than Anthony. And, um, you know, we trained together in, in lanes next to each other side by side. Uh, for uh, quite a, a, a while leading into those games, uh, over a year, maybe a year and a half or something, uh, maybe even longer than that, a um, year and a half or two, uh, maybe before uh, Sydney. Um, and uh, and so, yeah, we, we did the exact same sets, ate the exact same meals, had the exact same coach, you know, basically on the same sleeping routine. Uh, and... and uh, through trials, we went one, two, uh, back and forth between prelims, uh, semis, and finals. Uh, did the same in Sydney in the prelims and semis. Uh, and um, yeah, I knew all along that he was capable of winning it. 
Um, you know, the people that you train with, I, and I was always training with competitors. Mark Kizarowski was another one in the finals of those uh, games uh, that was part of our training group. So we had, you know, four guys, uh, you know, that were in the finals uh, you know, that were uh, racing every day off the blocks in, in practice. Um, and, and there's a lot of sports psychology, um, even if it's unintended, uh, you know, uh, or mani is it not manipulative, uh, you know, just who's swimming better, you know, who's you know, the winning the, the lead up meets. I mean, that stuff has a tremendous impact. And so it was competitive. Yeah. It was very competitive. I always respected him as a competitor. He was not ever uh, ruled out just because of his uh, age. Yeah. Wow. Was it just as fulfilling to win the gold medal in a tie or did you, I mean, how did you feel about that? Yeah, it, it, even more so. I, I, I couldn't have scripted it better. Uh, we got two gold medals for the United States out of one race. For, and uh, and my friend, my teammate, guy that I care a lot about, um, that I respect, um, I did not mind sharing the podium uh, with him and uh, was uh, amused. It took, uh, you know, if you go back and watch that race from Sydney, I know you won't, but uh, if you look at the video footage, I'm looking at the scoreboard with it's just confused. First of all, I'm squinting because I, uh, I like it's hard to see that 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 far off. I'm squinting because I I, I I touched. I look up and it, I don't care about the time. I never cared about the time. It's just for me racing, beating the guy in the lane next to you. So I'm looking mm -hmm. for the plates uh, and I see not the number one sign uh, next to next to my name and start celebrating. And then I look over and I see Anthony's celebrating more than I am. And uh, like, I, this is how competitive we are. He's, his celebration is, is better than my celebration. Was like, not? So I look up and I see the number one next to his name. And because I didn't look at anybody else's number. I didn't, I, 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 don't, I just, I just won the Olympics. I, like, that's, I, I wasn't like reading through to see who got third or fourth or, and so I see the number one. And the first thing that crosses my mind is, DQ. I, I've been DQ'd. Uh. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking hard at the board and then looking at the times and and, and, and so there's a moment on that uh, post race uh, in the in the video where I'm, I'm look, looking hard at that board like trying to figure out what just happened. It never happened uh, in, in men's race at the Olympic Games. I tie yeah. for the gold medal. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was strange. Yeah. Even when I heard it, I was like, no way. No. I mean, that's not possible. And Wow. Yeah. Incredible. Um, so yeah, that, that's a, that's a cool experience, you know, but, um, yeah. so was there any thought then of, uh, hanging it up after Sydney or were you more inspired to keep going? No, you know, I, I, that's like, I talked earlier about the platform and you know, the, um, about that, what that accomplishment in sport was able to create in terms of diabetes advocacy and the work in the diabetes community. I threw myself into that. Okay. And I always, you know, since the diagnosis in uh, March of 1999, uh, I ran a parallel career to my while I was competing, a world class athlete, uh, working in the diabetes sector uh, for large pharmaceutical and medical device companies initially, and building out patient outreach programming and stuff like that. So I was really busy. I was uh, in the year. I, I would I would take a year off um, after each Olympics I competed in. I took a year off after each Olympics. Wow. Now I, I just uh, immersed myself in, in the diabetes advocacy world and, and doing that. And so um, it, it, there wasn't a, an immediate decision to uh, chase down 2004 at that point. I was just busy doing good work in the diabetes community. Um, and, and, um, and it wasn't until after that, about ye a year, a little, a little more uh, break that um, – I decided to get back in and, and, and start swimming again and see see where see where I could take it. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I was um, I was inspired to keep going. Obviously, I had disappointment. I had that taste in my mouth of bitter disappointment going to a home Olympics and and not performing the way I wanted to. And again, by a tenth of a second missing the final is just gut wrenching. So I was. I was ready to get back into it. Um, I had a couple of uh, races against Anthony, you know, 2001, 2002, you know, when he was still swimming and, and performing. And 
and so I got to know him really well. Um, there was also there was also a story that I heard about Anthony. Tell me if this may be true or not. Uh, but he was so talented that um, he would go missing from practice occasionally. I don't know if it was before this Olympics or after, but um, what I had heard is that Mike Bottom was trying to track him down one day, and was like, "Anthony, why aren't you coming to practice?" And uh, and his answer. Again, this might be mythology, but his answer was like, Coach, what do I need to practice for? He's like, because you, you got to get better. He's like, but I'm so much better than everybody already. What, what, what's the point, you know? Um, does that sound like something that's true or not? I know he missed a lot of practices, but I, I, I didn't get uh, his uh, excuses uh, as to why. You'll have to ask him about that quote. I, I, I didn't hear him say those words. Okay, that's a good one though. But so then, so 2004 is where we kind of uh, finally meet in the Olympic final. Um, and this is where kind of our paths crossed again. But I've got a picture here, of, uh, a very famous picture of you, the way that you presented yourself for that final. And I'll, I'll just show everybody. This is, uh, this is you in the robe. Now, um, as everybody knows, as a swimmer, you have to be in the ready room at a certain period of time before the race. And so we're in Athens. It's an outdoor pool. It's very, very hot that night. I think it was, you know, in the 80s. Um, and I had waited all day to, to swim in this Olympic final. I did my warm up. I talked to my coach and I decided to get down to the ready room and, and be ready to race. And um, I had swum really well the night before and I'd broken the Australian record. And uh, so I go down to the red room and I'm the first one there. There's no one else there. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, they'll turn up in a minute. I'm, I'm really focused on myself. But so I'm sitting there and I'm all serious and I'm kind of just getting my mind ready. And the very next person to walk in is you. And you've got this, uh, this robe on, this very famous robe. And, uh, and it took me by surprise. You know, I, uh, I, I didn't expect you. I wouldn't expect anybody to walk in like this unless they had uh, a, an extreme amount of confidence in themselves. Um, tell us the story of the, the road real quick, and then how do you have the confidence to walk into a ready room like that? Well, the, um, the robe came about um, from uh, Everlast. So I, 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 Grew up, my, my grandfather was a, a swimmer and he would wear a terry cloth robe to the bath, to a ba like a bathrobe uh, to the pool. And it was functional, you dried off with it and stuff. And it was like, um, it's just a towel. Um, you use it as a towel and keep you warm or like a parka. Mm. And, um, and so I, I wore these black robes up in Berkeley. Uh, like some of my friends up there, and we got some matching robes and, and, and we were wearing them. And, and that, so we took them to trials in 2000 and um, I ordered uh, one for everybody that was training together at the time, which was um, about uh, 12 of us and, um, and uh, called the world sprint team is what mm -hmm. we were calling ourselves. And this is a uh, first iteration of what became the race club. Yeah. Um, of uh, kind of true clubs of, so if you will yeah. and um and and so we were all wearing these robes at trials and everlast picked up uh the story um when it came out and uh so he contact the ceo of everlast uh contacts uh my agent dave arluck and uh and and says hey uh the robes uh, we got the woman in Brooklyn who sewed the robes for Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier from the boxing matches back in the seventies. And she's going to make you this custom robe with your name across the back. And I said, oh, this is great. And this is wow. years before 2004. So I'm uh, wearing this, it, it shows up and it's satin, uh, which takes away all the functionality of a terry cloth robe <laughs> towel. And um, it's very flashy. It's got my name emblazoned across the back and I've got matching boxing shorts. And so I start wearing them out to meets, and I wore them to like the Pan American Games, and I wore them to a bunch of other meets and stuff like that. So I get to the uh, Athens Games, and I wore them at trials and stuff like that, and and um, and I and I go to the national team director, uh, Everett Uchiyama, uh, who's now a lifetime ban guy uh, for inappropriate activity, 
And I say, Everett, I understand that there's a uniform policy that uh, you get a large sponsorship check from the companies that uh, demand that we wear this outfit. And I want to honor that. I'd like to wear the outfit, but I also don't want to disrupt my pre-race rituals, right? Um, so this is the most important meet in my life. I don't want to change up my pre-race routine. Um, so it would mean a lot to me if I could wear the uniform and then I wear the robe over it open so that you can see the uniform underneath. And he says, no, absolutely not. I said, okay, I understand. Thank you. Um, and I knew at that moment that I was going to break the rules, uh, <laughs> that I was going to take the robe with me. And so I went back to my room. This is right before finals. Um, and I go back to my room and, um, and I take my robe and I roll it into a towel. So, and I roll the towel up uh, so that you can't see the robe on the inside of this towel. And um, that's why I got to the ready room so early was because uh. Uh, I, I didn't walk in with the robe on. I walked in, I unrolled the towel, and then put on the robe. Uh. Uh, within, gosh, just a, a, a minute or two at most, uh, Everett, this uh, national team director, was at the door uh, signaling for me to come over, and I just give him the no. Uh, and and uh, he completely lost his mind and was uh, pulled away, kicking and screaming uh, from the ready room by, uh, oh. security, by security. He was trying to, like, get at me, like, right before the race. I, and I just, so uh, he was so mad, so mad that I did that. It helps, I think, a little bit alleviate uh, the intensity of the situation but after I won, you know. But I, but I had to break the uniform rule to get that robe out on the pool deck. And I was fined more money from USA Swimming uh, than I had made from than they had paid me over the previous three years. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, so it was worth every penny. I tell uh, that story a lot, and, and it was you know more people remember the robe than the race. And uh, yeah, it was just uh, it's something that I felt like I had to do. Too. Uh, there was a lot of other uh, underlying stuff too. I mean, it was the first Olympics after the terrorist attacks, nine eleven. Uh, the first, and, and uh, there were security concerns. So none of the Team USA uniforming stuff was red, white, and blue. It was red, white, or blue. Uh, there were, you know, very small emblems that would identify the athletes as U.S. athletes because uh, there was a fear that we would be targets. And so for the first time uh, ever, there was an, an American flag flown in the Olympic Village um, and, and identifying where the athletes were staying. And that just, to me, was wrong. And so, I, you know, I, I was a conscientious objector in, in, in terms of that this is the greatest honor, right, like, that we get to represent our country. I mean, that's what yeah. makes the games neat, right? And that's the incentive. Instead of going to the NBA and making millions of dollars, we get to represent the United States of America. And we're yeah. sold and, and, and exploited, frankly. Uh, in, this, in terms of sacrifice, uh, that you give up a lot for that honor. And that, to me, it felt like it was being taken away from us uh, by not being able to um, have uh, the United States flag. And so, yeah, maybe, uh, so I think that the robe, the stars and stripes on that too um, was uh, fitting, uh, you know, if not um, uh, unruly. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's always an awkward time when you're introduced and you don't really know what to do. Was uh, was your was your reaction here? I mean, it's a very famous photo. Like I said, was this was this planned the way that you were going to uh, kind of introduce yourself to the world here, or was that spontaneous? No, I mean, there were always a few um, that were consistent. You know, I, I did this one a lot. Um, you know, even before or after a race. Um, you know, I'd throw up the, uh, the, the, the Richard Nixon peace sign. Uh, I, I think I did that one uh, before the race as well. Um, also, you know, important uh, considering the time. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, the, and, and so, um, yeah, there was sometimes, like I said, sometimes it was uh, chest thumping. That's a good one. Uh, muscle flexing with the bicep kiss in there. That's a, that's a good one. That's uh, it'd been popularized a lot since... Uh, that's uh, those days that I was doing it uh, back in high school. Uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I don't know, just having some fun. But, yeah, I, you know, you just go with the feeling. Like I said, when you walk out there, you, you're overcome with this rush of uh, adrenaline and, and 
nervous energy and who, who knows what could happen out there. <laughs> yeah, for Anything, sure. Uh, especially after they uh, announce your name behind the blocks, you're free to do whatever you want, a little dance. I've done that. I did a little Elvis dance one time, I think, uh, before uh, trials race. Oh, wow. Well, one of the things that upsets me is the um, kind of misunderstanding of the 50 freestyle because a lot of people who don't swim it or aren't very good at it or just don't know how to coach it or whatever it is, they will say that, um, you know, it's a crapshoot. You know, it's a roll of the dice. Anybody can win. And, and I have a real problem with that. And um, and for somebody that won back-to-back -back Olympics and and – for somebody like myself who got beat by you, uh, I think that takes away from your performance and and your ability to to win the race. Um, how do you feel about that statement? It is uh, it is not a crapshoot. If you look mm -hmm. at Olympic champions, uh, you've got Alex Popov who won back to back fifty freestyles. I've won two fifty freestyles, and Anthony Irvin has won two fifty freestyles. Yeah. And look at the uh, top performing yourself in Australia, uh, Florent uh, Manager. Uh, there, there's a, a lot of a lot of great swimmers that consistently get their hand on the wall first every time. Uh, yes. The margins are one hundredth of a second. The cumulative yes. margin of victory for the two individual Olympic gold medals that I have in the fifty freestyle is one one hundredth of a second. I tied to the hundredth of a second with Anthony in two thousand, and I won beating my friend and teammate uh, Dude Draganya from Croatia uh, by one one hundredth of a second in 2004. So two races, the only margin of victory, one one hundredth of a second. Um, but if you look, you know, it, it, it's always the same names in the top five, top eight, um, you know, uh, world rankings. I mean, people, some people that have that ability, they just know how to get their hand on the wall first. Absolutely. I completely agree with that statement. All right. Uh, some things that I'm interested in here. What is the last thing as you stand up uh, on the block there in Athens and you look down the pool, I can remember the setting vividly in my mind. It's beautiful. But as you stand up, the cameras are here, the crowd's here, the tip, everything's going on. What's the last thing that you can remember uh, standing on the blocks? I have to say, um, 2004, um, I, I, it was beautiful. The sun was setting. It was a warm summer night I, and I'll never, and I, and I, and I remember stopping. Maybe it was after, it was after I had been announced. I did a little razzle dazzle thing, put on the cap and goggles. And there was a moment somewhere in there where I took in the beauty mm. of just the sun. Me too. I did that too. Beyond, yeah, beyond the, the crowd and the cameras and all the distraction of everything like that, it is just a beautiful, beautiful scenery. Yeah. The, the, the sunset and the ruins in the background and everything, I mean, that was there. It was uh, really, really neat. Um, and then I, I remember saying, it, like, to myself, I'm not at my best. I'm, I'm going to have to force this one. And I remember saying that very specifically. Like, I just, whether, you know, we all have ridden taper just a few days too long, you know, yeah. like I, maybe I was like on the backside, like I, I, I didn't feel 100%. And I remember just saying, just gonna have to force it. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and, I, and, I, and I just, I, I wanted it, I wanted it. And uh, yeah, I, and, and so stepping up on the blocks, it was uh, time to get tough. Absolutely. And, I mean, you, if you watch that race back, you can see, you know, the. You, it's not that you're that far ahead of anybody necessarily. It's the it's that that last reach that you took, and, and you can see in your mind you reach with intention of I'm winning this race. Like you, you reach out and, and touch that wall – in an effort to beat the people that are right next to you, you know, and, and it really just comes down to a matter of will. And, uh, and I can see that visually when I watch back the race of like, but you used every single inch of your body to get your fingers on the wall first. Would you agree with that? 
Yeah, and that was the difference between uh, the swimmer that I was in 1996 and uh, the swimmer that I was in 2004, eight years later. That's what I had learned. Mm, wow. That's awesome. That's awesome, man. Well, um, very impressive career. Uh, it was a pleasure racing against you. It's, it's nice to kind of get in your head a little bit as well. Um, appreciate you taking the time with us today. It's been an hour already, so I'm going to kind of wrap it up here and um, just thank you again. And uh, how's, your, how's your health these days, by the way? Everybody's uh, healthy on this end for the time being. Uh, this is uh, scary times and uh, just trying to do uh, everything we can to uh, keep healthy. Good. And your, your diabetes is, you know, under control and, and that's, that's going okay? Yeah, managed, managed. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, nothing to uh, speak of in terms of uh, complications or anything like that. Uh, it's a day-to-day -day management uh, uh, process um, ongoing. So um, doing what I can and uh, I'm just trying to avo avoid that uh, COVID uh, thing that's going around. Yeah. Well, good. Well, Listen, man, it's hard to argue from my end that you're not the greatest sprinter in, in history from, from my point of view. So um, your accomplishments speak for themselves, uh, your, your, your competitiveness. Um, but here's one thing. I want to leave you with this, by the way. And I'm not sure if I've told you this. I think I have. But um, a lot of people have an opinion of you, whatever it is, whether it's a media opinion. or They don't really know you. But, um, you know, you may come across as arrogant, let's say, because you wear a robe out there and you do your whatever it is. You kiss your muscles. But I'll, I'll say this, at the end of the race, and I had never experienced this before, um, before this race or even after this race, the only time um, somebody's ever done this, you won the race and you jumped out and you waited uh, for everybody to pass you and you shook their hand and thanked them um, at, the, at the end of that 50 freestyle. And, and you gave me a hug. I actually have a photo of it. I wish I had to pull it up. There's you and I and we're embracing and we're hugging and and you just thanked me. And um, and that's something that really stuck in my mind. So for people that whatever opinion they have of you, you were uh, a sportsman all the way down to the end. And um, and I really appreciated the fact that you did that and, and it meant a lot to me. Thank you, Brad. You know, any uh, respect um, is mutual. And uh, I, I, it means a lot coming from you. And, um, you know, when you told me that story, uh, I was really touched. By that, uh, and, uh, you know, it's uh, got a lot of respect for you and uh, for everybody else that was in that pool uh, that day. And uh, yeah, it means a lot to uh, maintain this friendship uh, this many years later and, and uh, to have watched you continue to evolve and grow and take that uh, intimate knowledge of the sport that you have and be able to share that with other up and coming swimmers. Uh, whether it be through collegiate coaching or, or, or through Fitter and Faster and the clinics that you're doing or these web, webinars, I, it's neat to see you giving back to the sport and that level of appreciation that hopefully was demonstrated that day on the pool deck in Athens 100%. after the 50th battle, but also uh, here ongoing in the work that you're doing. Thank you. Appreciate it, man. Well, thank you. Yeah, it means a lot. And I know that, you know, as you said, one of your former managers, the guy that we work with, David Arlock, has put all of this together, and he, he cares about the sport as well, and we, and we do clinics together, and that's a thrill for me now. So, again, I uh, love working with you and, and uh, very proud to call you a friend. So thanks a lot, Gary. Thanks for being with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Take care. Bye. Stay healthy, everyone. Bye. Bye.